Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. The conflict in Syria continues to shed rivers of blood. Tens of thousands of people have been killed in a bloody war between a brutal dictatorship and opposition movement, many of whom are backed by other brutal dictatorships, specifically Qatar and Saudi Arabia. It's a very complicated and very tragic situation. One of the main players in the situation in, Tur in Syria is Turkey. And now joining us to talk about Turkish foreign policy and what their agenda is as regards to Syria is now joining us Berish Karaj. He's a lecturer in International Development Studies at Trent University in Ontario. He's also the editor of the book Accumulations, Crisis and Struggles, Capital and Labor in Contemporary Capitalism. And he joins us from our studio in Toronto. Thanks for joining us, Berish. My pleasure. So what, what are Turkish objectives in, in Syria? We know, uh, as far as, as I understand it, Turkey has been involved from very early stages. Uh, so we've been told they set up major refugee camps in Turkey before there were very many refugees. Uh, they, they seem to have been in on a kind of plan with Qatar and Saudi Arabia. Uh, is that correct? And what do they want? Yes, there are many refugees, but there are also many rebels right now uh, within uh, Turkey. And uh, Turkey has been uh, providing them uh, with a lot of logistical support. And, of course, some of it comes from uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar. But first, uh, I would like to talk about the uh, historical relations between uh, those two countries. And until 1998, uh, the relations were quite stormy, actually, uh, because due to, due to mostly three uh, reasons, factors. One of them is the uh, status of Hatay, uh, a, a southern province that neighbors uh, Syria, which joined uh, uh, Turkey in 1939. And Syria has always claimed that it, uh, it's uh, historically a part of uh, Syria, and uh, the majority of people living there are Arabs. The second is the uh, conflict over uh, water. Uh, the, uh, the two rivers, the Euphrates and Tigris, and this has been a major source of conflict between the two countries. And the third one uh, was the support that was given by the Syrian government, the Syrian state, to the uh, PKK. But in 1998, Syria, uh, 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 due to a lot of uh, pressure from both Turkey and uh, the international committee, uh, community, had to kick uh, Abdullah Öcalan, the leader of the PKK, out of Syria. And uh, this uh, started a process of friendly relations. And one half of the Assad died, uh, actually the president of the uh, uh, Turkish uh, state republic went to Syria to attend the funeral. Uh, we, uh, and a, a Turkish president had not been to Syria in a very long time. But these relations got even better during the uh, government of the AKP. And until uh, the... Uh, Trouble started in 2011. Uh, the relations between those, those two countries can be uh, considered brotherly. But I'm using the word uh, on purpose because uh, 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 Erdogan and uh, Bashar Assad used to call each other brothers. And until two years ago, or only two years ago, uh, those two people were making uh, vacation plans together. But with the uh, events, with the insurgency in, uh, as a part of the Arab Spring in 2011, these relations uh, started to uh, deteriorate and at a very fast pace. And in, uh, when uh, scholars, when analysts uh, look at the, the causes of the uh, deterioration, many people speculate. And uh, it is actually very difficult to say something definitive. But uh, I think what happened is that uh, the Turkish state, the Turkish government, the AKP, was not expecting this to happen in Syria. And when it started to happen... Hold on, this, this meaning the uprising against Assad? The uprising in 2011, yes. Mm. And they were, I, I think they, they were caught by a surprise. And when it started to uh, get worse, or when it started to spread across the country, uh, the Turkish state started to side with the uh, so-called uh, uh, Syrian army the rebels. Now this was to, uh, you know, once things got militarized, and some people are suggesting one of the reasons it got militarized so early was, first of all, because Assad used 
terrible violence against peace, peaceful protesters, but then Qatar and Saudi Arabia, and to some extent the Americans, although it seems to me it was more Qatar and Saudi Arabia that drove this, uh -huh. saw an opportunity and helped get this thing militarized more quickly than it might have otherwise. But where was Turkey in that scenario? Well, Turkey, uh, first, I, I think they hesitated in terms of what to do. And uh, then they bet on the rebels uh, uh, in terms of these people, uh, this really uh, diverse group of uh, people who rebelled against the uh, Syrian government to win in the end. And then Turkey jumped on board and started to support the rebels alongside uh, uh, Qatar and uh, Saudi Arabia and, of course, uh, the United States. Now, is this partly to do with competition between Turkey and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, that Turkey didn't want the Saudis and the, and the Qataris controlling the outcome of a Syrian revolution, that Turkey needed to have its hand there? Well, Tur the, I, I think we should locate this uh, within a, a broader discussion of uh, the shift in a foreign policy strategy in Turkey in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, many people have given it uh, different names, but I, I would like to call it uh, Neo-Ottomanism. Uh, this idea of neo-Ottomanism, which actually promotes uh, greater engagement in uh, those territories, territories that used to be controlled by the Ottoman Empire, by the Turkish state today, is not a new uh, idea. It was first, uh, it became popular with uh, uh, Turgut Özal, who used to be first the prime minister and then the president in the 1980s. Uh, but it was not until the AKP government that it started to be implemented. So Turkey was seeking a leadership uh, role in uh, those territories, which used to be controlled by the Ottoman Empire for centuries. And I, I think uh, this, again, what the question that you pose should be located within uh, that uh, uh, context. Well, to what extent, then, is Qatar, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey kind of co-managing the region under the American umbrella uh, or, or are we going to be seeing a rivalry uh, in Syria to start with, even with Turkey versus Qatar and Saudi Arabia? I mean, we've talked about how much Syria is a proxy war, not just for Saudi Arabia and Qatar, but also the United States and Russia and, and even China to some extent. Does, what is Turkey's role in this proxy war? And They're clearly one of the most affected, given the, the, the border, the, they're right on the border. I think uh, we should be looking at this uh, question at a much higher level, at the Eurasian uh, level. I think there's a struggle for uh, hegemony, influence and hegemony, hegemony in uh, the broader Eurasian uh, territory, uh, geography. And we have uh, Russia and China on the one hand, and we have the United States and its allies on the other. I don't see... Uh, I don't foresee a serious conflict between uh, Turkey uh, on the one hand and Qatar and Saudi Arabia on the other. I, I, I think uh, this, is a, uh, this is part of this uh, uh, struggle over particular ener energy resources in Eurasia between those two blocks. Now, to what and Turkey definitely sided with the United States and its allies in the region. And that's, I guess, the, the, what's really at the heart of my question, is, is what has emerged is a Qatari, Saudi, Turkey as sort of the managers of the American sphere of influence, or partners, if you want, in, in the Middle East, in, in alliance also use and making use of the Muslim Brotherhood, first of all in Egypt with Morsi, and are they also trying to bring to power Muslim Brotherhood in Syria? Yes, they are, definitely. Uh, so there's some, definitely, I think there's some subcontracting going on there. But at the same time, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not big a fan of these uh, analyses which uh, see the United States or this imperial power as a omnipotent, uh, which determines the outcomes of uh, any political process around the world. I think in this case, what we observe in Turkey is that uh, the interests of uh, the United States are overlapping with the interests of a group of a, a, a part of the a Turkish society. And again, this has a lot to do with the internal dynamics and internal uh, transformation of Turkey in the last 30 years. Turkey today is not the Turkey of the 1970s or 1980s. Turkey is much more confident, and uh, particularly when we look at uh, Turkish capital today, 
Turkish capital has, uh, has been investing over a, a territory extending from Siberia to sub-Saharan Africa to Latin America. And these people, they want a much uh, uh, confident as well as much uh, uh, inf- uh, powerful, uh, assertive foreign policy by the Turkish state uh, in the Middle East or in Eurasia today. And the second thing is that, of course, we, we cannot... Uh, talk about these issues without, the, uh, uh, without one very important actor in the Middle East, and that is Iran. But before we, before we get into Turkey and Iran, mm-hmm. the, the situation in Syria is so tragic. There have been so many people killed. One would uh-huh. think Turkey could have, and still could, in fact, have play a role to find a somewhat more peaceful, less drastic uh, transition or resolution in Syria, but, but Turkey doesn't seem to be playing that role. They seem to actually be uh, putting fuel on the fire. Turkey has been definitely uh, putting a fuel on, uh, on fire. And, uh, actually, I don't think that Turkey uh, got into the Syrian conflict without uh, U.S. Uh, encouragement in the first place. But it even went beyond what uh, Turkey went uh, beyond what the uh, United States was expecting it to do. And uh, even the United uh, the Americans started to warn Turkey not to get, into, get involved too much in the conflict. But right now, Turkey is uh, pretty much in there. It's, uh, it's one of the most active and assertive uh, players in the Syrian conflict. And, of course, uh, a part of it is related to uh, the Kurdish question. Turkey is really afraid that the Kurds in the uh, northern part of Syria, and uh, there are about 2 million Kurds, uh, constituting 9% of the Syrian population, uh, Turkey is really afraid that they will uh, achieve autonomy and preserve it and uh, maybe eventually unite with the other parts of uh, uh, Kurdistan. So, so the issue now for Turkey is, is overthrow Assad and then hopefully a Muslim Brotherhood government comes to power and suppresses the Kurds in Syria? Well, keep them under control, definitely. They would like to keep the uh, Kurdish movement and the Kurdish territories under control as much as they can. And uh, in this case, of course, if Mu- the Muslim Brotherhood comes to power, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, is insisting on an a- Arab Republic. So they, they are not uh, so interested in all. They, they, not, they will not, uh, they're, uh, they're, I don't think that they would agree with uh, most of the demands by the Kurdish population in Syria. So uh, uh, Turkey would prefer that option. Hmm. All right, thanks very much for joining us. We'll continue this series of discussions about Turkey with Barish in further interviews on the Real News Network. Don't forget, we're in our year-end fundraising campaign. Uh, there's a donate button over here. Every dollar you donate gets matched. If you don't click on that, we can't do this.